Welcome to the Next Level Human Podcast. As a human, you have a job to do. In fact, you have four jobs. To earn and manage money, to attain and maintain health and fitness, to build and sustain personal relationships, to find meaning and make a difference. None of these jobs are taught in school, and that is what this podcast is designed to do to educate us all on living our most fulfilled lives through the mastery of these four jobs. I'm your host, Dr. Jay Tita, and I believe we are here living this life for three reasons and three reasons only, to learn, to teach, and to love. In this podcast, I will be learning, teaching, and loving right along with you. I'm grateful to have your company. Here's to our next level. Welcome to the show, everybody. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about a topic that um, has been on my mind for a while to do. Um, get a lot of questions over at Metabolic Living on this, but I think that given the listener base of this particular podcast, lots and lots of females and lots and lots of health professionals who work with females in particular, I thought this would be a great sort of one-two punch to sort of answer all the questions for people who uh do Metabolic Living's Metabolic Renewal Program and all of you professionals who listen to the podcast to sort of get tools and tips and tricks for your practice specifically regarding women. So this uh, is going to be all about the different female hormone types. Now, before I get into this, I want to say, where does this come from? Well, back, what is it now? I guess two, three years ago, I wrote a book and released a workout program called Metabolic Renewal. And this was the first of its kind, as far as I know, or we knew at Metabolic Living, that is a specific program for women. Now, one of the things that you have to understand is in the health and fitness world, it wasn't until about 2001 that regulating bodies and, um, you know, some of these organizations that passed down mandates and recommendations started saying and realizing that and admitting really that women were underrepresented, drastically underrepresented in research in general in the health field and specifically in the fitness world. Part of the reason for that is twofold. One, uh, going back years and years and years ago, academic institutions, uh, institutions of higher learning were dominated by men. The healthcare industry was dominated by men. And most of the student body would be young college age men that they were studying. That's the first thing here, simply that uh, women, when we go back 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago were not as represented in the institutions of higher learning as they are now, especially when we look at the upper echelon of PhDs and people actually doing this research. And second of all, and this is, uh, you know, um, sort of an underappreciated aspect of this, female metabolism is more complicated than men. And I know a lot of people will balk at that a little bit. Men and women will find that a little bit uh, hard to swallow. But just think about it uh, just from the menstrual cycle. Men uh, have sort of a static hormonal situation throughout the month. Women, since the time of puberty, are essentially fluctuating hormonally, uh, you know, essentially day to day, really. So they have this unique hormonal fingerprint, woman to woman, um, that goes on uh, with their menstrual cycle. And of course, they have pretty pronounced, um, you know, hormonal changes based on stage of life. Men have this too, but not to the same degree. Women get pregnant, men don't. There's a specific hormone sort of type associated with that one that's kind of dominated by uh, high amounts of estrogen and progesterone, but mainly progesterone, which is a unique sort of situation for women. And then, of course, you have perimenopause, menopause, and postmenopause in women that are unique hormonal situations in and of themselves. And so this is important to understand these two reasons. Now, the other thing that I want to point out as we have this discussion is the following. And that is that this idea of types, right? So I wrote a book back in 2010 called The Metabolic Effect Diet, and it had clinical types, sugar burners versus muscle burners versus mixed burners. 
And anytime you start dealing with metabolic types or the biochemistry of types uh, or the physiology of types, it creates a, a sort of confusing factor because the truth of the matter is there is no such thing as types. There is no such thing as a burner type. There is no such thing as a hormone type. So let me say that again. There are not three different burner types, right, that I described back in 2010 in my book, The Metabolic Effect Diet, nor are there seven different female hormone types. So you might be saying, well, Jade, what are you talking about? You're the one who wrote it down in your book, and metabolic renewal has these seven different hormone types that I can take a quiz to determine what my type is, and now you're telling me there is no such thing. And what I mean by that is that there is not seven different female hormone types. There are infinite different female hormone types. But one of the things that we do clinically, rather than giving one size fits all solutions, what we do clinically is we tend to bucket certain signs and symptoms and uh, sort of ways of uh, reacting uh, into sort of one bucket. So for example, in my book in 2010, The Metabolic Effect Diet, what we do know, and actually this is becoming more and more clear through recent science, is that if you give one person a piece of bread to eat, and then you measure their blood sugar response and their insulin response to that piece of bread and their appetite suppressing effects of that bread, and then you give a same piece of bread to another person and measure their insulin reactions and cortisol reactions and blood sugar responses and appetite suppressing responses and craving responses. And then you do that to um, another person. What you'll find is that each of these people react differently to this bread. Some people might react with more insulin and a higher glucose excursion. Some people might react with less. Some people might get more of a cortisol push. Some people uh, may have suppressed appetite for hours. Some maybe not. And what we do is when we are looking at sort of these rubrics or these buckets, these types to put people in, is we say, well, you know, these people over here, although they're all slightly different, um, have a similar reaction. They all tend to get big insulin or glucose responses from bread. And these people over here get less of that. And so then we can label them a particular way. So it's just a clinical tool to make a better guess than we would have been able to do Otherwise, so I want to be clear on this. And the reason I want to be clear on this first and foremost is because one thing happens that's very strange with the human brain. As soon as we label, as soon as we put labels on things, people get very, very anxious and very, very attached to those labels. So if I tell you you are a hormone type 2, you get very, very anxious. Is that the right hormone type? Are you sure you got it right? It doesn't seem to fit. These questions didn't ask me enough questions. You know, can that be right? Am I really hormone type two? And then you get very attached to that. Oh my gosh, I'm hormone type two. I can only eat what they tell me to eat with hormone type two and on and on it goes. And so there's a benefit to types because it helps us manage this infinite array of possibilities, but there's a severe disadvantage to giving types because people get overly attached and place way, way, way too much sort of merit into them. These are clinical tools anyway. So you might say, well, Jade, what's it a t- what is it a tool for? What are you essentially trying to do? If everyone is different, right, and this is one of the things I've become sort of famous for in my work and what we do over at Metabolic Living, if everyone is different, uniquely different, almost like a your physiology has a unique fingerprint, so does your psychology, you also have personal preferences and practical surroundings that impact your sort of way of manifesting health, fitness, and weight loss goals. Well, if everyone is different, how do we account for infinite possibilities? Well, one of the things that we do is we first, as a first step, we give you a blueprint to follow. We stick you in a bucket. And then once you're in that bucket, which hopefully, not always, but hopefully if we did things correctly, gets you closer to your unique type than you otherwise would have been if we just gave everyone a one-size-fits-all approach. And then from there, once we get you in that bucket or label you that type, we can then teach you how to read the signals coming from your physiology so that you can adjust and tweak and change and and sort of manage your reactions, measure your reactions so that you can get closer and closer and closer to your own type so that a hormone type 2 hormonally in a woman named Natalie, let's say, 
becomes hormone type Natalie once she is working with this hormone type and then adjusting and tweaking and changing it according to her needs and whims and her metabolic responses. So that's how this works. And I want to be very, very clear about that right from the get-go. These types are not perfect. They should not create anxiety. You shouldn't get overly attached to them. They're purposely broad. The questions asked to determine these types are purposely broad. Purposely broad because we're not trying to find your exact type. That's impossible without working with you directly and seeing how food impacts you directly and seeing how exercise impacts you directly and seeing how your results respond to certain changes in calories and macronutrients. That's how we get your exact type. We stay pretty broad when we give you these bucket types because we want Lots of flexibility within that. So you might say, well, Jade, how accurate is it? It's not that accurate. It's somewhat accurate, but it's not nearly as accurate as what can be achieved by adjusting it. So the next thing to know about these types is they are just a beginning point. You are entirely missing the, the point of this if you decide to try to, be, to rigidly adhere to some arbitrary clinical metabolic type. So what we want to agree on right here, for those of you who have ever taken this hormone quiz, and for those of you who are working with women and and have learned and taken my course on um, the Metabolic Female, which is a certification course for professionals to learn about, you know, females in particular and the differences between them, we all need to agree that these types are a starting place, not an ending point. They are a starting place, not an ending point. Are they better than the standard one-size-fits-all approaches out there that books and gurus and documentaries and all these things do? Yes, they are, but they're still not very good. They're not very good until you begin to adjust, tweak, and change them according to your needs. So now that we're sort of clear on that, I'm going to give you sort of an indication now of these types with you keeping in mind always that these types are a beginning point and you're going to need to adjust and tweak. Now, I'm not going to go through so much the adjustment stuff, but we'll do that a little bit. You can go through past episodes of mine and look at this and I'll do some specifically on how to, you know, adjust uh, your sort of process as you go along. There's an episode in this podcast called How to Find the Right Diet for You. And actually, let me go right now and see if I can find it uh, for you all. Just bear with me real quick and I'll actually give you that particular episode number um, on the Next Level Human podcast. And this is back when uh, when um, I basically was uh, the Jade Tita podcast, which I later moved to the Next Level Human podcast. So one of the episodes that you'll want to check out is episode seven, doing everything right and not getting results. That's a really good one. Episode seven of this podcast. And then the next one you want to check out is, let's see if I can find this, um, how to find the right diet for you, which would be episode 24. This would basically be a great two to also listen to as well as this one. All right, so let's get into this real quick. So first, let's go through with the female menstrual cycle and the female hormones. The way I like to describe estrogen, and some of you have heard this description before, but it's very useful. And I think the more you hear it, the better, because the more you'll begin to pass it on and understand it for yourself and pass it on to your clients. The best way to understand estrogen and progesterone is as two twin sisters who are non-identical. And I phrase it that way because obviously twin sisters are reliant on each other in a way that regular sisters are not. And this is true of estrogen and progesterone. For example, estrogen primes progesterone receptors. Progesterone primes estrogen receptors. In order for the body to make and respond to estrogen, it needs to make and respond to progesterone. And so these two things are linked. If progesterone goes away, estrogen begins to struggle. You end up like in a perimenopause state, for example, as you stop ovulating and stop producing progesterone, you start seeing that estrogen doesn't know what to do. Sometimes it'll be high, sometimes it'll be low. It's all over the place as a result of losing that balancing influence of progesterone. So estrogen and progesterone are twin sisters. They're completely relying on each other. However, they're not identical twin sisters because they don't do the same thing. They're non-identical twin sisters 
because they have slightly different actions. So estrogen, the best way to think of estrogen is the resilient, adventurous, rambunctious um, sister. She is the one that is the go-getter, the explorer. She is brave. She's courageous. She wants to go out and attack the world. When estrogen is dominating, women feel um, have higher self-esteem, greater motivation, greater stress resilience. They can tolerate higher amounts of calories without gaining fat, as much fat, and gain a little bit more muscle, and they can tolerate lower calories without losing as much muscle and instead losing more fat. And if you don't really understand what I'm saying there, remember the metabolism is more like a multitasker. If you're in calorie excess, it's going to be gaining fat and muscle. You just hope it's gaining more muscle and less fat. If it's in calorie uh, deficiency, it's going to be losing fat and muscle. You just hope it's losing more fat then muscle. Estrogen allows that to happen. When estrogen is around in a calorie deficit state, you're going to lose more fat and less muscle. When calorie, when estrogen is around in a more calorie excess state, you're going to gain more muscle and less fat. And so it has this sort of approach. And it also allows women to tolerate more training, higher calorie deficits, and um, more you know, calorie excess, if that's the case. In other words, it is sort of the more athletic of the two sisters. It is really a great time to be pushing athletic style training. So estrogen is very much this way. Now, progesterone is sort of the opposite to this. Progesterone is the sister that's worried about estrogen. She wants estrogen to be careful. She thinks estrogen is going to get in trouble. She thinks estrogen might hurt herself. She thinks that estrogen is going to, you know, sort of um, create, you know, issues for them. And so she's always telling estrogen, hey, you know, calm down, you know, um, make sure you get enough to eat or uh, don't eat too much or, hey, don't push yourself too hard. Hey, we need to rest and relax, these kinds of things. And so you want to think of these two as yin and yang with estrogen being more yang and progesterone being more Yin. Now, they do do some things that are similar. Uh, they both fight stress. So you can think about estrogen as being the better stress fighter. Um, if you kind of think of estrogen, uh, think of this as, you know, Joan of Arc in her suit of armor with her shield. Well, estrogen is the suit of armor. And progesterone also helps block some cortisol effects and stress effects. So, but progesterone is the shield. Estrogen might be a little bit more strong uh, in its anti-stress effects than progesterone is. And so, and this is, uh, you know, sort of debatable. And one of the reasons why it's debatable is because when you're under high stress, uh, you lose progesterone levels seem to drop off first before, uh, before estrogen uh, levels. And you can remember that by if you're in a battle, you're far more likely to get your, your shield knocked out of your hands than lose your suit of armor. And so this is what, how I like to conceptualize this. So they both help fight against stress. However, they have opposing actions as it pertains to insulin. Uh, estrogen is insulin sensitizing, while progesterone makes you less insulin sensitive. And this makes sense since progesterone is dominating post-ovulation when there is the potential for an egg to be fertilized and become a baby. And so obviously progesterone is the worried sister and is smart and says, hey, we might have a baby coming along. So hey, body, let's save some fat and some sugar by being a little bit more insulin resistant. So we have a little bit more triglycerides or blood fats floating around in our blood and a little bit more blood sugar in floating around in our blood to support this baby. So this is the difference between the two. Now, as it pertains to the menstrual cycle, usually what is going on is the 28-day cycle. Now, I say usually, and it's not even usually. It's just typically that's how we learn it, but every woman's going to be different. So in this typical, you know, quote, typical, uh, you know, sort of um, aspect of the menstrual cycle, you can think of estrogen dominates for the first two weeks of the menstrual cycle, day one being the first day of bleeding. Estrogen dominates during what we call the follicular phase. It's called the follicular phase because it's the time where the follicle, which contains the egg, is maturing under the influence of follicle-stimulating hormone, FSH. So think of follicle-stimulating hormone maturing the follicle during the follicular phase. And as that follicle matures, estrogen levels rise and rise and rise. Now, at this point in time, 
estrogen is playing by herself. She's out on the seesaw. She's out in the park. She's running around playing by herself. Progesterone is still home napping. There is no progesterone in the system to any relative degree here. Women are very much like men in this state. No progesterone or very low progesterone and dominating estrogen. Now, under under the influence of luteinizing hormone as this follicle matures and the feedback happens to the hypothalamus, uh, you know, because of the buildup of SSH, FSH, luteinizing hormone will spike this other hormone called LH. And it causes that follicle that was maturing to rupture and for that egg to be released. So that egg goes away. And now that follicle becomes what is known as the corpus luteum. So under under the influence of luteinizing hormone, the follicle ruptures becoming the corpus luteum starting the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle that corpus luteum becomes the source of progesterone and then progesterone dominates along with estrogen so it's not that estrogen goes away at that point it's that now they're both out playing and progesterone is wanting estrogen to take it easy a little bit and 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 ease up and be careful. And so when you think about the first part of the menstrual cycle, the follicular phase, this is a time where estrogen is dominating and women feel more motivated, can focus more, are more resilient to stress and like can really push themselves, train like athletes, can really push calorie deficits or not uh, fare as bad in a calorie excess. And then when progesterone comes along, a lot of that begins to reverse. And so I oftentimes talk about the idea that some women may want to cycle their training and eating along with the menstrual cycle, really pushing the stress levels where, and by the way, anytime you have too much food or too little food, that can be a stress. So the the best time to overeat or undereat would be during the follicular phase when estrogen is dominating. The best time to overtrain or undertrain would be when estrogen is sort of dominating. When progesterone's around, you have to be a lot more careful in your food intake and a lot more careful with your food choices and a lot more careful in sort of uh, your exercise choices and a lot more uh, sort of mindful of uh, reducing stress through other mindful activities like lots of walking and spa time and anything that relaxes a woman. And so this is sort of an overview of this sort of state. Now, in episode two of this podcast, I go through this in detail. So if you want more of this information I just went through, you can go back to episode two. But now let's go through the hormone types now that you sort of understand this. So hormone type one is sort of your typically menstruating woman that has this normal balance between these two sisters, estrogen and progesterone. She gets this normal menstrual cycle. Estrogen dominates sort of in the beginning. Progesterone dominates sort of at the end of the cycle, and then everything kind of repeats again. Now, in hormone type 2, what typically begins to happen is that for whatever reason, and I'll go through some of these reasons, uh, estrogen starts to dominate more than it should in the second half of the menstrual cycle. So what happens is estrogen starts to be dominating and exerting more influence. In other words, progesterone can't rein estrogen in. This is hormone type 2. And this can occur because we are swimming in an environment filled with estrogens. Uh, Bisphenols, most commonly bisphenol A, but others in plastics, uh, chemicals of industry, um, pesticide residues, uh, all of these sort of things, even uh, phytoestrogens and things like that in some of the foods that we eat, push more of an estrogen sort of state um, in the body. In addition, each woman has a different uh, ability to detox estrogens. And some women have uh, what is known as a uh, increased recirculation of estrogens. One of the ways that estrogen is detox is it's put through the liver, it is conjugated and methylated and all these kind of things. It's dumped out in the gallbladder. It should then pass out through the stools. But sometimes that estrogen can be reabsorbed, recirculated into the system and contribute to the total estrogen pull and, and the total estrogen influence. This usually relates to conditions that are more estrogen dominant in a clinical sense, things like um, fibroids, things like fibrocystic breasts, uh, things like endometriosis, these kinds of things. So estrogen starts to dominate. And because estrogen has some negative impact on thyroid, this also might start to um, 
you know, disrupt some thyroid function. So these estrogen dominant women tend to also have sort of this puffy waterlogged look that comes along with estrogen, which is a little less of a diuretic than progesterone, but also thyroid hormone, which is notorious for causing some sort of mixed edema or, you know, sort of, um, you know, swelling um, and sort of holding of water. And so these women tend to be a little bit more thicker, have a little bit more of a water sheen on them and tend to usually be, not always, but usually be a little bit more overweight. And so we got type one, normal sort of estrogen progesterone balance. You got type two, which is more estrogen dominant. And then you have type three, which is more progesterone deficient. Now, the hard part here is that estrogen dominance and progesterone deficiency are very hard to tease out. But one of the ways you can think about this is think of estrogen dominance as sort of too much estrogen due to increased intake from exogenous sources or decreased detoxification and increased reabsorption of estrogen. Think of progesterone deficiency as uh, a stress effect that occurs through lack of um, ovulation and or decreased sort of uh, output of uh, progesterone to the corpus luteum for uh, any number of reasons. And these are clinical diagnoses. And you can see part of the reason that this can sound a little bit gray zone-ish is because we don't have really good ways in medicine to diagnose these states. And so these are usually clinical descriptions, although that is getting better when we look at things like the Dutch test and other things that we can use to sort of pin this down. But you can kind of think of progesterone sort of deficiency as sort of more of this stress-related uh, sort of effect where cortisol starts to dominate, knocking away the progesterone shield, so to speak. And so, yes, you'll still have a relative excess of estrogen, so it can look a lot like uh, estrogen sort of dominance, the type, the hormone type two, but it's not coming from sort of this increased intake or decreased sort of uh, detoxification of estrogen. It's more coming from a direct inhibition or lowering of progesterone due to lack of ovulation. And this oftentimes occurs, not always, but these types tend to look clinically a little bit leaner um, in, in their effect. And one of the other ways to look at this, one sort of a condition that I see uh, sort of spans uh, both type 2 and type 3, both estrogen dominance and progesterone deficiency, is PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. PCOS, uh, there are heavy types and there are lean types in PCOS. Well, the heavy type PCOS tends to be more the estrogen dominant type of female, and the lean type PCOS tends to be the um, progesterone deficient uh, type of, uh, you know, sort of a female. But there are different conditions here. And this quiz, this hormone quiz uh, tends to, uh, you know, try to tease that out best that it can. Now, the fourth type here is where you get both estrogen and progesterone deficiency. And this looks very much like a mini menopause, except these women aren't in menopause. They're just in extreme stressed out states. And believe it or not, this happens most readily in women who are uh, in severe deprivation diets or severely overtraining. And so this can happen in very fit looking females. It's also sort of known as the athlete triad because it can happen in female athletes who are really pushing their calories low and uh, their, their exercise to the excess. And this makes some sense, of course, uh, because obviously if uh, you are under extreme stress, uh, the body is going to be smart and say, hey, we really don't want to um, you know, have a baby here because there's too much stress on the system. Because when you think about it, this is the primary driver of metabolism, reproduction to survive long enough to reproduce and spread on your genes. And if you are not in a situation where you're getting enough nutrients or putting out too much cal too much energy, the body says, okay, forget about menses, forget about this natural cyclical rhythm of the two sisters, estrogen and progesterone. Let me uh, just shut all that down and focus on survival right now. And so this is 
typically a result of when people start losing periods or getting spotty periods or becoming irregular due to different types of stress. Now, again, these ten, these women tend to be either extreme. They can be extremely overweight because that's a stress in the system or extremely underweight because that's a stress in the system or normal weight, but engaging in these extreme sort of activities or even getting under an extreme illness or anything like that. And so that is a very much sort of hormone type uh, four. Then we have hormone five, hormone types five, six, and seven, which really get us into uh, menopause. At perimenopause, what begins to happen is ovulation starts to occur less and less. And obviously, if ov- ovulation does not occur, you have this situation where estrogen is outplaying alone, but estrogen gets sort of volatile and cranky and confused and overwhelmed because she doesn't get to see her sister anymore. And then she gets worried about her sister and she starts to be very volatile. And this is the state where you start seeing when ovulation disappears around perimenopause, you'll start seeing estrogen get cranky for lack of a better word. And sometimes it's very high if you measure it. And sometimes it's very low if you measure it. And where it's, when it's very high, you can get, you know, sort of flushing symptoms and hot flashes and stuff like that. And when it's very low, you can get depression and those kinds of things. And because progesterone's not there anymore, which progesterone acts as an anti, you know, sort of anxiety, you know, sort of hormone, you start and, and sort of a diuretic, you start seeing these women holding water. One minute they'll be puffy. The next minute they'll shed that water. Water. Uh, estrogen has a hard time keeping up and it feels very volatile and sort of rough and abrupt. And so this is sort of the perimenopausal state. Now, as that perimenopausal state goes from type hormone five to type hormone six and estrogen falls off too at menopause, then we're sort of back to a permanent state of estrogen and progesterone deficiency, except this time it's not necessarily a result of increased stress and chronic Uh, unopposed stress. It's simply a result of the ovarian output not being there anymore. It does have primary sort of ramifications though, because now that menopausal woman is far more stress reactive and less stress resistant because she's lost her shield and her, her suit of armor. And she is far more insulin resistant because she has lost estrogen. And this is where women oftentimes can fare a lot better in menopause by simply um, managing insulin a little bit more. So yes, counting calories and managing calories as always, but maybe perhaps moving to more of a carbohydrate uh, counting approach as well as a calorie counting approach and also focusing very, very much on stress reduction. And this can be tricky for women at menopause because they often think, well, hey, I was eating and exercising like this before and I got great results, but now that same eating and exercise can be st- too stressful um, or not, uh, you know, or still too insulin producing when they get into menopause. And so they have to make these sort of smart adjustments. And then, of course, the last type, which is hormone type seven, is really exactly like hormone type six almost all the time, except there is a certain subset of women who are postmenopausal where the ovaries still contribute a significant amount of testosterone. And this is sort of this weird thing where you'll see lots of women at menopause have low estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, but sometimes testosterone will either be uh, being put out at the same degree that it once was, and or more likely uh, uh, testosterone is more relatively higher than it was previously. So whereas it might absolutely fall and be low, it's relatively speaking, it is higher than it it was relative to estrogen and progesterone before. And this can cause sort of some masculinizing effects. And this is one of the reasons why uh, women start to look a little bit more like men in their body shape at menopause and postmenopause, because uh, estrogen and progesterone is gone and testosterone might be exerting a little bit more influence, even if it's very low. And it's also the reason why, by the way, men start looking a little bit more like women as they get older because they start to estrogenize uh, a lot as well and testosterone starts to fall. So it's sort of this just weird sort of thing. And I don't mean anything derogatory by it. It's just an interesting thing when you look at very old couples together. Sometimes you can't tell who is the male and who's the female because of this estrogenizing effect in men and this test- uh, this masculinizing effect in women as a result of these sort of hormones. And so these are the hormone types. To repeat, they are not set in stone. They are, you know, uh, just clinical entities, blue blueprints, starting places. 
They are not exact. It's not an exact science. It's a clinical guideline to use. And one of the things I'll say here is that oftentimes women get very confused, very anxious, and very adamant and attached to the idea of, well, you didn't give me the right type. I had a hysterectomy when I was 30. And so what type does that make me? And it's hard to pinpoint this, but obviously if you had a hysterectomy where both ovaries were removed, that immediately, no matter your age, puts you into menopause. Estrogen and progesterone are gone at that point the, the the unless you're on bioidentical hormone replacement therapy estrogen and progesterone are gone if you get uh, both ovaries removed in a hysterectomy and for those who don't know for the men among us and even some women who might not know a hysterectomy can be any number of things it can be a full hysterectomy where the uterus is removed and the and both o- and both ovaries are removed or it can be a partial hysterectomy where uh, maybe the uterus is removed but the ovaries are intact or the uh, uterus is removed and and one ovary is intact and the other removed. And so if you have your ovaries, both ovaries, then uh, we have to look at clinical sort of manifestations. And oftentimes, in, you know, when you're taking quizzes like the one for metabolic renewal, we're using menses a lot of times, menstrual symptoms and menstrual regularity and those kinds of things to determine the clinical type that you that we might start you in. Well, we lose some of those clinical symptoms as soon as you uh, have lost the uterus and you're no longer bleeding, which makes it a little bit more difficult for sure to exactly um, get your pinpoint type. But normally, when you take this quiz, if you've had a full hysterectomy, you are automatically assigned to um, type five, six, or seven, depending on your age. Um, but even young women with a full hysterectomy will be put in the uh, hormone type 6 menopausal state. Now, if you have, if you're a very young woman, less than 30, uh, and you've had a hysterectomy, but your ovaries, one or more of your ovaries are intact, normally we use other symptoms to determine your type. But if you are over 30 or 35 and you've had a partial hysterectomy, you'll usually be put into the perimenopausal um, sort of or or menopausal state based on a uh, sort of your symptomology. The important point point here is is that this typing is just the beginning. And so from there, what we begin to do is we give you a diet, exercise, and lifestyle recommendations based off of your type. And then from there, we begin to play metabolic detective. We begin to look at your biofeedback, what's going on with your sleep, your hunger, your mood, your energy, your cravings, something we call SHMEC or SHMEC. Is your SHMEC in check or is it out of check? And SHMEC is sort of a catch-all phrase for all biofeedback. So yes, sleep, yes, hunger, mood, energy, and cravings, but also exercise performance, exercise recovery, um, uh, libido, um, and signs and symptoms of disease, especially digestive type stuff. And then also, what are your results? And so are you losing fat? Are you maintaining or are you gaining? And then we adjust from there. We tweak, we adjust, we sleuth like a detective putting in and out things to, you know, adjusting macronutrients, adjusting calories, uh, almost always adjusting food first to then get the metabolism going. And in that adjustment phase, your type ceases to be the type you were you were when you took the quiz and starts to be your individual type. So if a woman named Natalie or a woman named Jessica takes this hormone quiz, she might start at hormone type three, but by the end of it, she becomes hormone type Natalie or hormone type Jessica or hormone type Barbara. In other words, there are not seven different hormone types. There are infinite hormone types. And the first, you know, sort of uh, idea here is that when we type you, that's just the first step in finding Jessica's type or Natalie's type or Barbara's type. It's only the first step in the process. And most people, because of the way the brain works, most women go, oh, this is the end of the process. No, it's just the beginning of the process. And because it's a subjective process, it is not always as exact as we would like it to be. And a lot of tweaking and adjusting needs to be done based on the woman. So I'm going to start stop this conversation right here. I hope this is useful for you. I know many of you are going to ask about this quiz. So let me just uh, make sure that I have this quiz, um, you know, sort of correct. You can go to, um, let me just grab this while I'm here really quickly and see if I can make one of these links um, for you. Why don't we do uh, www.drjade.com metabolic renewal quiz, all one word. So it'll be 
jade www.drjade.com slash metabolic renewal quiz drj.com slash metabolic renewal quiz if you want to take this quiz it also just keep in mind when you take this quiz it will throw you into a sales process um, for you and that may be annoying to some of you or not so just keep that in mind if you want to see this quiz type regardless of what you do with this type remember it's the beginning of the process not the end all right hope you enjoyed today's episode and i will see you at the next one